The International Christian Embassy Jerusalem is your embassy in the heart of Israel, founded in 1980. From our headquarters in Jerusalem through our branches in over 80 nations and yours in Canada, we seek to challenge the Church to take up its scriptural responsibility, to remind Israel of the promises made to her in the Bible, and to be a source of practical assistance to all the people in the land of Israel. On today's program, a teaching about the restoration of Israel to the land of Canaan. Our panel discussion addresses the logistics of a two-state solution. A look at the unique art of ICEJ co-founder Merv Watson. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, write in a book all the words that I have spoken to you. For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will bring them back to the land that I gave to their forefathers, and they shall take possession of it. Once again, welcome to the Spotlight on Israel. What a joy to speak with you on behalf of the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem, the Canadian branch. I want to share a few thoughts with you today about the restoration of Israel. And uh, first of all, I would like to tell you that the restoration of Israel to the land of Canaan is something that is vouched for in the Word of God that goes way back to Abraham. It is the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 3 that says the Abrahamic covenant cannot be annulled and it cannot be abolished in any way. He said that even men, when they sign contracts and seal documents of sale, they don't go back afterwards and change them. And Paul the Apostle says, that the promises that God made to Israel and the Jewish people in the Abrahamic covenant cannot be annulled. And again, the writer of the book of Hebrews in chapter 6, in encouraging Messianic Jews, believers from the Jewish world in the first century who had accepted Jesus, he says to them, they can know that God is faithful to them and that he loves them and will keep faith with them because of the promises of God to Abraham. And then the writer says that God, by two immutable things, by which it is impossible for God to lie, by his word and by his character, he gave the promises to Abraham. And these promises include the promise of land. And whenever the Jewish people have come back to the land of Canaan, there's been a conflict, there's been an uprising. There's been a desire to disinvest them of the land and to remove it from them. A tiny piece of land that is no bigger than a game reserve in South Africa. The whole thing is ridiculous at first glance. But ladies and gentlemen, the root of this conflict does not lie in a political dispute or some type of debate about colonialism that took place as a consequence of the aftermath of the First World War. This debate has to do with an ideology, a radical, radical, militant Islamic ideology that actually says that any piece of land that was once under the heel of Islam, under its domination and sovereignty, can never return, can never return to those who formerly held it. And if it does, it constitutes a charge of apostasy over Islam. For more than 800 years, the land of Israel was under the dominance and the sovereignty of Islam in many ways, but finally under the Turkish Ottoman Empire. The establishment of the nation of Israel in the heartland of Islam was something theologically that for militant and radical Islam cannot take place. It must be reversed. And if we ignore this major pillar in this conflict, and we make as if it doesn't exist, when all the time it's the elephant in the room, we will find ourselves, by political correctness, supporting an agenda for the destruction and the murder of the Jewish people. It is not by coincidence that the actual constitution of Iran is apocalyptic. The constitution of Iran demands of the Iranian people that they liquidate the State of Israel on Islamic grounds. Now this is the truth of the conflict. We have to understand that. And building into that 
is then this whole question of the boycott, disinvestment, sanction campaign that actually started in Canada in Toronto. This campaign has as its agenda not a two-state solution, not a one-state solution, but a complete dismantling of the Jewish state. It is rooted in anti-Semitism. It is therefore so depressing and awful to see Christian churches aligning themselves with a militant, radical, Islamic agenda for the destruction of Israel and ignoring it in every one of their statements and their press releases. As if it doesn't exist when the charter of the Palestinian Authority continues to, to call for the destruction of Israel and the charter of Hamas calls for the destruction of Israel and the murder of every Jew. It is shameful, absolutely shameful, that Christian churches can ally themselves with such an agenda. We need to pray for the church because once again, it is betraying the Jewish people and playing into the hands of a radical Islamic agenda for their murder. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to think about this. You cannot ignore it. You cannot leave it. It is an urgent matter that must be addressed and this doesn't mean that every Muslim is evil or wicked. But there is a raging, militant, radical Islam in the Middle East today that is killing and beheading Christians and has in its gun sights the Jewish people. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Hello and welcome to our Inside Israel panel discussion. Our topic today, the logistics of a two-state solution. Is it possible? Joining me as guests, Mark Vandermas, Julio Gabelli, and Bob Mayton. Now, I'm going to give my little point of view here, and I'd like you guys to take it away. I've always wondered, when, when you put two people or two entities to sit down at a negotiating table, there needs to be goodwill. That should be the starting point. We both have an objective. In this case, a two-state solution. We both want a two-state solution. But if one party wants to obliterate the other, and it's written in every charter, I, I don't understand what that is, what, what's in that, how that could possibly be. A boss also indicated openly that in a Palestinian state, there will be no Jews. Mm -hmm. So from the point of view of wanting peace, I think everybody could agree, at least I would hope so, and want peace. But the purpose of our discussion is to talk about, is that possible to have a legitimate two-state solution? Let's start with you. Christine, oh. that, is, uh, that is the question of the century. Personally, I believe it's not possible to have a two-state solution. As some experts have actually said, the vision of a two-state solution simply remains a vision. And to implement a two-state solution practically is literally impossible. I personally feel that the Bible makes it very clear that once the Jewish people returned to the land, God had given them that land, and that land would not be divided. And so it's clear to me that, biblically speaking, it is not possible. If it does succeed... I believe it will be short-lived and it will fall apart because God's word is eternal and his covenant will never be revoked with the Jewish people. Okay. I, I just, I'd have to say that uh, uh, the problem, it, it won't work. Uh, the problem is that it's, this whole two-state solution is predicated on a lie. Mm. And the lie is, is that the Jewish people under duress are being forced to confess to crimes they haven't committed. They're being forced to confess to land theft. They're being forced to confess to, uh, to uh, illegal occupation. Uh, the mandate for Palestine makes it very clear that the world promised them that they could rebuild their communities in the very areas that they're now being condemned for. 
So the solution is to stop talking about solutions and let's look at the original two-state solution from the League of Nations, yes. the mandate for Palestine. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, I think what should happen is that the Prime Minister of Israel should call a moratorium on all solutions until the world re-acknowledges and promises to respect the promises and obligations that were in that original solution. Only then can there be any solution uh, discussed, any, whether it's a one-state solution or a two-state solution. Okay, Bob? There is a convergence of events going on currently which uh, create um, a real problem for Israel. It may be an opportunity, as, I, as I've said in the past, but uh, it could also create some risks for Israel, which is that um, the, the borders and the boundaries and the, the balance of power between Russia and the U.S. is being reshaped in the Middle East. Uh, Iran is coming into the picture. There, there are possible alliances coming up between Sunni, Hamas, uh, and, uh, and Iran. Um, the, uh, the Palestinians seem to be taking advantage of this uncertainty in this situation by refusing to come to the negotiation table. Um, they've threatened to withdraw from the Oslo Accords, which are the foundation of, of negotiations. Um, they're also raising a Palestinian flag at the UN uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And so we see that the world is not interested in supporting Israel at this point as a whole, except for uh, the U.S. and, and uh, Russia. Uh, but that support is very ambiguous at this point, and it's not clear where that will go. Uh, so the Palestinians are using a strategy of confronting Israel, of uh, trying to force them to, uh, to concede. Um, there are tunnels being built. All the money that was given to uh, the uh, Hamas to replace the, the buildings and structures that were lost and destroyed during the 2014 Israeli excursion uh, into Gaza are being, uh, all that money is being used to, to buy armaments and to dig tunnels um, and offensive structures. Uh, there, there can be no trust with an organization that does this kind of thing. Um, and, and so the situation seems to militate against it at this point. The Palestinian suffering is what tends to really grip people's heartstrings and lead to a lot of these debates, and and it it it, it ends up being a, a fiery debate. What about the Palestinians? I, I think we could agree that the Palestinians are suffering, but Israel is the one that gets to blame. Hamas is the one that, for instance, hides their their weapons, human shields. They'll put it in hospitals. They'll put it in schools and in 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 public areas. Israel goes in their defense forces, and they'll announce, "We're about to strike. We're about to retaliate yeah. based on the strike that you first did." And then when all these deaths come up because they they refuse to, well, it's not that they refuse to move. Their own leadership tells them don't move. Then Israel gets to blame. And I think this is one issue that is very. Um, it, it's an explosive one, the That's suffering of explosive. the Palestinian people. And the biggest question is, at whose hands? Yeah, I, I, you know, historically, I mean, it's been proven that the Arab nations are using the Palestinians as pawns right now. Um, if they had goodwill to help them, there would not be these problems. The suffering that they're experiencing is not caused by Israel. Israel is not the uh, the... Israel is, Israel is not an apartheid state, and Israel is not an occupier in that sense. In fact, the humanitarian needs of the Palestinians, the Israelis have been the greatest contributors to the humanitarian needs of the Palestinians. Unfortunately, that is not being disseminated no, no. in the international I'm community. I'm glad you're bringing that up yes. because there have been there have been many eyewitness reports that does not make it into the mainstream media of the Palestinian people at the ground level diametrically opposed to their own leadership. Yes. And if you happen to visit Israel, you, you, the happiness on the Palestinians' faces when they're intermingling in, in, in areas like East Jerusalem, which is considered um, disputed territory, it is amazing to see the happiness of the Palestinians. They're working they're thriving yes. and they're happy. But we keep hearing the worst part of the news yes. during attacks that were not um, facilitated or initiated by Israel. Well, you have, to, you have to look at the power of the narrative. And that was brilliant, what the Soviet Union did in, tr in turning the Arab, uh, the anti-Israel movement from one of pushing them into the sea to one of portraying these people as victims was absolutely brilliant. So now um, uh, Israel is not seen as 
the underdog. And the problem with Israel's narrative and much, much pro-Israel uh, advocacy is that it actually feeds into that because they don't address the core issue. It's like somebody throws rocks at your kids and breaks your windows in your house. Then they call the police on you. They take you to court. They call in the media. And instead of standing up and saying, Your Honor, here's my land title deed. We were, the world promised uh, Jewish people we could rebuild our national home. They say, they're saying things like, well, you know, we really want peace. And, you know, my cousin's a nice guy. Uh, my, my, cu my friend cured cancer. I saved lives in Haiti. We need the land for defense. Um, well, you know, the neighbor's worse, so why don't you criticize him instead of us? And, well, why don't I give you half the land anyways? And hopefully, if you just promise not to try and throw rocks anymore. And it makes Israel look guilty. Every mm -hmm. time they avoid the core issue is, you ha they have to address the issue. Are Jews owners or occupiers? And once you decide, I believe they're owners. If you're owners, then hold up your land title deed, stand on your hind legs and say, world, you have to acknowledge these rights. And then we'll talk about whatever solutions you Well, in want. terms of the topic that we're discussing, <clears throat> is a two-state solution possible? I think the bigger question is, if you look at both sides, if you look at Israel, you look at the Palestinians, does Israel want a two-state solution? It's clear Israel does. They've gone to the negotiating table. They've withdrawn from lands on the Palestinian end. It's written in every charter. Mm -hmm. Hamas, Fatah, the, the Palestinian Authority, it's written everywhere to obliterate Israel. So how could you argue for a two-state solution if you really don't want one? I mean, that, to me, is the bigger question. Do both sides really want a two-state solution? Yes. Final point. I, and I, I okay, think, ahead, I think the, um, the position of Israel on Palestine is, is uh, really great. I, they've built a wall, which is, and they're accused of apartheid. Um, but their self-protection, their security is so important. I love the fact that Israel uh, is, considers itself still to be the light to the nations. And there, there is this mm -hmm. biblical basis to that. And when uh, tragedies happen in the world, for example, you brought up Haiti. Um, the first team in there, the first yes. medical team in Haiti Israel. to uh, to start working with the people who had been injured Israelis. were Israelis. They sent in medical teams. They were there first. Uh, and this happens all the time. The Israelis get no credit for this. Um, they treat the Palestinians, I believe, very well. Mm -hmm. um, they have to defend themselves. It, it, there's a security issue. And possibly at some times uh, on an individual basis, mistakes are made. But on a policy level, uh, the Israelis have the right approach to Palestine, and I think to the rest of the world as well. I, I don't point, think Bob. they can be blamed for that. And great point, all of you. And that concludes our segment. <laughs>
And at that time, I, I was completely absorbed in music. It took a lot of work to do to learn all these instruments in a short time. Three months per instrument. So you had to take it from nothing to play something. So anyway, I, I did some artwork while I was there, but not, not, not a lot. But it, when, I got, when I found out the, the my courses were a bit frustrating, to say the least, and I had art. I, 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 can get, I can get into art, and it just it transports you to another place. And so it was very important. And spiritually, I was looking, 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 and looking at that point. I was raised in a Christian home. Um, and so I basically believed, but I didn't, wasn't going to go for the whole schmazola. I, I, I said, there's some things I got to know myself. So I left it all for 10 years. And at that time, I was going through art and I was going through philosophy and I was reading books. And I read a, a lot of Ayn Rand when I was 13, which is quite young for that book. It was very deep philosophy. But there was artists in there and they encouraged me to be uh, more art inclined. So I thought da Vinci was the last, Leonardo da Vinci was the last word. Van Gogh was my hero, uh, or Van Gogh in, in Netherlands, and Michelangelo. And uh, so I started to copy their work. And uh, that plus the uh, my encouragement from my teacher, um, I discovered that I had some ability. So then it just, the rest is kind of history. I just see different objects that I like to reproduce. One of my favorite subjects, of course, is, is mountains. This one is just a quick little uh, Israeli giraffe. Now this particular technique is not too well known on the West Coast here or in Israel, where we're, we're spending a lot of our time. Uh, it's called a scratch board, and literally that's what you do. You, you, you receive this black piece of paper, you draw a very light line drawing, and then you, you just take it from there and, and draw the animal or the picture out of that. And um, like, well, this one is this one's strictly from memory. This one was, this is called a winter tree. And I just made that up. But it's, it's, it gives the feeling of, you know, bare branches and storm clouds and all the rest of it. So it's all very literal. I have a theory that because all the nations were involved, in a sense, in the Holocaust, they knew about it, but they didn't do anything that they're both their music lost the melody and art lost its subjects. And so you end up abstracting things. The melodies are that are in composers' lives uh, up in well, the 30s and 40s and 50s and beyond are usually you don't know where they're going. It's not something you can whistle when you leave the theater if you've seen a concert. And the art was Dava this, boop, yeah, this, bang, bang. all these artists were picking up abstract ideas. They were drawing out of the art. Ella Picasso, who led the way into a blind alley, as far as I'm concerned. So the gold master's technique was set, set aside, and they did everything from uh, a blob of this, a blob of that, and I just wasn't impressed. So I left all of that and, you know, studied music. So then I... Um, studying opera, I studied opera, did several operas, um, performed in the operas, and uh, then I found that I had to make some scenery in Jerusalem. So I d designed the scenery for an opera called Amala Night Visitors, which was a very elaborate uh, set. So I had to conceive it and then paint it and draw it and then also act as one of the kings, singing and music and hauling eight and ten bags and instruments and the accordions and all this stuff for years. And it's really time that I'd be realistic about my years. And this is far more, shall I say, passively, actively involved. In North America, our faces are fairly bland compared to where we're living a lot of time in Jerusalem. You get a phenomenal cross-section of different kinds of people, different people that have gone through an awful lot and their face show it. Uh, they they think a lot and their eyes show it. Uh, there's a, just a lot of, there's a different thing. So I, I enjoy portraits. I did a lot of portraits in university to put myself through. This is an old man making falafels that you eat in, in Israel. And then there's to, to a light. And I see as a metaphor, Israel's been sent to be the light of the world. 
and this guy is dealing with elemental food, and he's, he's have his own light, which he's creating. So he's feeding people, and he's also spending time philosophizing as he's cutting this, uh, these falafel pitas and so on down here. This is one of the synagogues that the Jordanians ruined when they were, they, they ruined 57 of them. And this is one of the ones they ruined was his left. And I thought the ruin was beautiful in itself. Uh, this is a, a desert sheikh and his camel, his trusty camel. They, um, these camels can go seven days without water. They get loaded up with water. And when Rebecca, in, Rebecca agreed to um, fill Aliezer's animals with water, we're talking about thousands of gallons. So these things are, are amazing, and I, I just like the expressions on their face. They always look so superior. This Bedouin woman is, carries all her valuables, her silver and gold with her all the time. Uh, so that this is her dowry. This is what she brings to the wedding uh, when, they, when they marry. And, the, uh, and this is amber. This is real amber. All the, the jewelry in the Middle East generally is the real thing. It's not uh, plastic. This is the real silver. Okay, this one I'm very happy with. It's, uh, this is the headwaters of the Jordan River coming out of Mount Hermon. A place called Panyas, or Pan, where they used to worship Pan, the earth god. And that's just down below this. And these are the, this is all done in um, pencil, crayon. And uh, one of the things that I want to do is get into the art world in Israel, because it's very rich in terms of quality and people and the rest of it. So I, have, I hope to spend more time in Israel um, involving myself in art lessons and the rest of it, either giving them or taking them. And uh, I think I can add something to the art world there. Thank you for joining us today, and be sure to visit our website at www.icejcanada.tv or call us at 1-866-324-9133. One hundred percent of what we receive from you toward a project goes to that designation. Through your contribution to ICEJ Canada, you can participate by giving to Haifa Home for Holocaust Survivors, Women at Risk Red Carpet Project, Operation Life Shield Bombproof Shelters, Shoulder to Shoulder Alias Support, Bet Singer Children's Home, Israel in Crisis, ICEJ Communication Media Fund, Christian Friends of Yad Vashem, Megan David Adam Emergency Services, Canada Israel Young Adult Scholarship, Equip and Teach, Bet Rachel Strauss Inclusive Community, Gift Estate and Securities Funds.